Hi, good evening everybody. Uh, welcome to another session of Once Upon a Time with Rinpoche with me, Pastor David. So, okay, today is a special because uh, next week is going to be Rinpoche's Pari Nirvana Day. So I thought I'd do something different. Originally, today's topic was going to be about uh, Doji Shukin's divination. That will be the next session. All right, so, um, but today we'll be doing a, a book discussion on my journey in this life. All right, just... Let me see if I'm online. Okay, it's loading. I can see myself. Goody. Okay. Okay, I don't see anybody. Just me, myself, and I, and Pastor Niral, and one like. Someone liked me. Oh. <laughs> Well, um, the idea about this book, of course, is uh, I, I thought that it's it's pretty new, as you guys know. It's, it's fresh off the press. Well, not that fresh anymore. It's about a couple of months already. But um, it is Rinpoche's autobiography. All right. So it, it's, it's about his life story from his perspective. So naturally, um, it's quite a lot to tell in a span of a book, and some some more is a easy reading book. All right. So I see a few people come on. Uh, good evening, Esther, uh, Xiao Pan, Xiao Pen, um, Yvonne, uh, uh, Venkata Subarao, uh, uh, Li Feng, and yeah. So anyway, just just to let you know um, why why this book is because uh, well it's because it's it's to, it's a special episode today because it's uh, Rinpoche's Pari Nirvana next week. So it is a time where when 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 you celebrate your teacher's passing, you celebrate his life. So that's why I thought I'd do this book. Basically, um, I'm not going to do a reading unless you have a particular. Maybe maybe at the end, if I have a little bit of time, I'll do the last, I think the last chapter, the prologue, sorry, it's not called a prologue, that's an epilogue. The epilogue is, um, is really good reading. It, yeah, it, is, uh, it tells the experience, the time when Rinpoche was in the hospital and of Rinpoche's passing. All right, so I thought that was nice. Maybe I might read that. We'll see how time goes. All right, so um, before we begin, I would like to, t to tell you the basis, the reason why we have a biography of a, a teacher, all right, of a lama, a guru, um, for a particular reason. Because in Buddhism, it's very important. It's, a, it's an important genre of um, Buddhist texts, Buddhist scriptures. Um, in, in the old days, what happens is, especially if there is a, a guru that is a particular, of particular importance, um, there would be a scribe, uh, a student of, a, of the guru who would actually record down the daily happenings of the teacher and uh, over time it will be compiled into a kind of um, a journal which will be used by the lama or by one of the students to write a biography. All right. So um, traditionally the biographies of high lamas are pretty much more anecdotal like chronologically it tells you what happens and uh, um, where the, the the lama was born the circumstances of his birth how he if he's a reincarnation how he's discovered who who was the lama who who was the the the, the people who discovered the lama's incarnation and then who is his teachers how is his education and then um, what happened what kind of retreats he did what kind of practices initiations he received from his teachers and then um, later on perhaps he does retreats or he teaches or he becomes a, a geshe uh, which is a um, an equivalent to a phd like in, in modern secular education, it's a PhD. In because in in Tibet, 
um, in the monastery is kind of like a monastic institution and a monastic educational institution where um, people study, the monks study um, theology, Buddhist, Buddhist uh, philosophy and, and stuff. So what happened is uh, you can be, if you, if you, um, you pass the, 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 all the various exams to the final one, you get a, what is known as a Geshe. And there's many, many levels. The highest is a Geshe Harampa. All right. So things like that. So basically, that, that's the and then what the Lama does, the monastery he he he, he uh, establishes um, the students that he had, the lineages that he that he established, the texts that he wrote, the books that he wrote, the organization. Well, these days it's not not really so much as a uh, monastery, but more like organization because now Buddhism is all over the world. So you have a Buddhist organization like a char. All right. So things like that. So that, that's what a biography is. But let me tell you a different story and in a sense of how this book came about. This is from uh, Rinpoche's, um, what Rinpoche told me. I don't think I saw it. I, I read the book already from cover to cover, but I don't think I've, I've saw that account in here. Long time ago, uh, what happened was uh, Rinpoche was upon sight recognized by one of his teachers. Okay, his name is Gangchen Rimichi. And Gangchen Rimichi told him, Oh, you are this incarnation. Um, you have don't sit on the floor, sit on the throne. So he was uh, Rimichi was placed on the throne immediately upon the first meeting with his teacher. And he was told that to tell his story. Gangchen Rimichi was very interested to know his story. And it was that during that period that Gangchen Rimichi, his teacher, told him that you have to write your story. It is important because uh, it would be beneficial for your students and for for people for disciples of the future. Because um, and Rimichi himself was a little initially that time Rimichi was very young, so Rimichi was a little resistant in the sense that um, he was doubtful, not resistant. He was doubtful about why should he write his story. He can, he doesn't have a fantastic story. Most most stories of high lamas uh, was like wow you know they are, they are like the golden child they were discovered at such an age and then they were brought to the monastery and they were excelled in their studies Rimichi was not discovered in the sense that um, as a golden child and brought to the monastery he was discovered from a very young age but if you read the book you will know more you can you'll find out more but Rimichi's story was quite different because Rimichi was not brought to the monastery Rimchi's mother de decided that if he was going to be who he, he is as a you know as an a Rinpoche, he will find his own way. All right, so I see a lot more people have joined. A lot of folding folded hands. I tell you what, instead of folding your hands to Rinpoche's story, would if you have if you know any um, part of Rinpoche's story that um, inspires you. Um, if, if you know of, uh, or if you have a question about any part of Rinpoche's life that you would like me to, to talk about a little bit more, I can. I may not be able to give you a lot of factual uh, um, dates and, and time, but I can tell you stories. Um, do let me know or ask me any question, all right? So that would be more interesting, more interactive, lah, you know? Or wh whatever aspect of Rinpoche's life that you find that um, inspires you or people have asked uh, asked you and you're not so sure and um, if you have read the book and you, if you like it um, or if I'm sure many of you have started reading maybe you have not completed maybe the parts where you have read um, what questions you have or what strikes you about Rinpoche's life because I will, I will tell you my version of it but you can ask me at any time all right well, within this hour, uh, I, I wouldn't, this session won't be so long, but yeah, actually I can go on talking about Rinpoche's life because there's a lot, because I, over the years, uh, Rinpoche has, from time to time, in, in between teachings, Rinpoche would tell his story, because in, when he was young, he was doubtful about telling his story, because I felt the same way, because, you know, when I was requested by Rimichi to, to write my own story, you know, there's no way but up. So I was like, why who was going to read my story? But then I was thought, then I thought, okay, Rimichi wants me to be a writer. You know what, what made me decide finally to write my own story was because if I'm going to write a, something, right, I'm not going to write a, 
you know, like Lam Rim or Introduction Buddhism, I might as, might as well write my own story because, you know, I have more to tell. It's my own life. Of course, I've got more to tell, isn't it? So that was my version. But Rinpoche, uh, for him, when he was young, he was doubtful about himself. He was doubtful about his identity. Even when Rinpoche was recognized, formally recognized, Rinpoche had doubts about his himself as being a Rinpoche. And he told Gang Chen Rinpoche, he told many, and he, he told one of uh, the Lama who enthroned him, which is uh, Kensuo Jampa Yeshe Rinpoche. And uh, can, he asked Kensuo Rinpoche if he can be un Rinpoche, you know, can we, you know, reverse the process. And then Kensuo Rinpoche was like, <laughs> he was just, you know, he was, uh, he, I remember reading in th this account is in this book. Um, Kensu Rinpoche just said, no, how can you un Rinpoche yourself? You can't. The, the process of enthronement is not, is not an application or something. It is something as a recognition of who you are in your previous life. So you have to continue your, what you're supposed to do. Okay, I see one question. That's very interesting. Pastor David, did Rinpoche give any tantric initiation to Kacharians? Thank you. Um, he has. He has given tantric initiations, uh, mainly lower tantric initiations. Lower tantric initiations. Uh, Trapo Sumchil, Amitayas. Uh, in the earlier days, there's Nyesun Kondro, um, before my time, lah, that is. Um, Nyesun Kondro, Manjushri, and some others I can't, offhand I can't remember, but I remember th these are the few that I remember Rimichi has given. Yes, Rimichi has given tantric initiations in the past. Um, yeah, where was I? Yeah, so Rimichi, when he was young, he thought, he thought, you know, he was, he, you know, he didn't think much of himself or his background. And then eventually when Rimichi got older and as he had more experience with students, he realized that um, actually he has a lot to share. And he realized that his story can be, can be of inspiration to others because uh, it doesn't, these days people are not really so, I mean, people are still very inspired by heroes and extraordinary people. But what for Rinpoche, it's not so much as these days, what people are more inspired is uh, for someone they can relate to. For, for a personality, a lama, a personality, uh, a media person, a celebrity, they can relate to. It's not so much as someone high on a pedestal and you want to you wish to be someone perfect. It's more of someone you can relate to, but they, they have led extraordinary lives or they have some kind of um, a gifts, capability, but their lives are normal. They're, they're just human beings like you and me. So when you can relate, so this is something that Rinpoche realized people these days um, are very fond of uh, and they, 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 they draw inspiration for peop from people like that. Okay, so this is how Rinpoche was is like, um, and he realized that his story has much to share, and um, for people because uh, Rinpoche had realized that this determination for the Dharma is not common. It's not it's not common in the sense that everybody would go through that kind of adversity for the Dharma. Rinpoche doesn't find himself extraordinary in the sense that he float in the cloud or he had extraordinary clairvoyance or magical powers or visions of Buddhas. He, he didn't, maybe he did, but he didn't tell us. Um, but what he did tell us was that um, he, he had extraordinary determination for the Dharma, overcoming tremendous obstacles, overcoming uh, lots of problems, and not, not letting any of these problems and difficulties deter his determination for the Dharma in benefiting others. In get, from the beginning, when he was young, it was to get teachings, to be near his guru, to serve his guru. He went through extraordinary lengths, you know, traveling from a first world country of America. He was raised in America all the way to India, which is third world. Okay, many of us, when we go to, from like for us in Malaysia, or wherever you are, um, if you go to another country that the conditions are different, perhaps lower of lower standard, for example, then um, it will be a struggle. 
So this is this is in this day and age, you know, the, you know, backtrack twenty years ago when Rinpoche was there, um, late nineties, early night, sorry, eight, late eighties, early nineties period. During that period, the the conditions at that time was different. All right. So it was uh, Rinpoche. Women we realized this, and that's that became the basis of why um, he he became to to take on this project that um, he felt was important, and it, it it took many many years for for this to fruition, and I would say that when you read it, it tells Rinpoche's story as a whole, as a whole. As in, you get a uh, an overview picture of Rimichi's life journey, but it doesn't tell in detail. It's, and some parts, um, because of from the perspective of flow, you know, when you read a story, because it's a story after all, it's a book, it's a story, so it it has to maintain a certain pace. All right, so it 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 is divided based on um, location. Because Rinpoche spent uh, different at different times of his life at different locations, so and of of course it's also chronological. Um, in a sense, chronological means from beginning to the end, from when Rinpoche was born all the way to, you know, to coming to Malaysia to teach. So there was there's a chronology. So um, and also um, there's one thing about this book. And um, it tells, in a sense, of what Rimichi. At the times, Rimichi had to water it down. The story has to be watered down. Perhaps it's the writer, perhaps it's Rimichi. But I must say, the writer did a really good job in maintaining Rimichi's um, tone. You know, his um, his 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 voice. You can feel his voice if you if you listen to Rimichi's teachings long enough you can and you read this book you realize it's quite familiar with the way Rimichi expresses and also um, that's this one that's the thing about this book all right and uh, oh yeah one more thing before I actually get into the story itself <laughs> is this uh, I mentioned this now it's a genre of Buddhist scriptures uh, this genre is called Namta a biography, autobiography, or just a biography is called a namta in Tibetan. Namta just literally uh, is translated as liberating story of a lama or, or a great practitioner. So what happens is uh, people read stories like that to gain faith, to gain confidence in the teacher, in his lineage, in his uh, his his great works, I mean, besides besides his lineage, besides his teachings, would be the um, the monastery he f he establishes, the um, the Kamsen or the sorority house he's from, and uh, whatever he's left behind, and uh, give confidence in who he is, what kind of um, background he comes from, and stuff like that. More so, more important is his his lineage. All right, the the his teachers before him and his students after, so that's that's the idea of a namta, a biography. All right, so most of most biographies, no, I wouldn't say most. Many of biographies are autobiographies in the in the Tibetan tradition. In a sense, it was written by the Lama himself. Usually, a scribe helps the Lama to do it, and is written from the first person perspective, meaning from the Lama's perspective. But there are many biographies also that are written third person in the sense that someone writes about the Lama or the uh, the Mahasiddha. Many of the, especially the earlier ones, many because many of the stories are lost. So what what was passed down orally is compiled into a story. So you don't get the full thing, but you get different stories from different sources, different texts. So that's how it goes. All right. That's from the traditional perspective, lah. And then from Rinpoche, Rinpoche uh, is interesting in a sense that his life story is quite unique. For a Lama, even for a Lama, he, he's quite unique because um, 
although he was discovered young, his path was different. Rinpoche was this um, was not brought to the monastery, was not given the education that is usually a, a for, uh, accorded to a high lama. He was actually raised as an ordinary child. Uh, initially, for a for a small short period of time in Taiwan, and then more so in America. For many many years, he was in America, and he was raised in a Mongolian family. And uh, he was led to believe that he was um, he was Mongolian. He was uh, the child of a Mongol family, although he was of mixed parentage, Mongol mother and Tibetan father. But he didn't know of his Tibetan heritage until much later on. So that was unique in a sense. He was brought up in a modern family. Um, they were traditional only to a point of just, you know, like, um, how would I say, like Sunday, you know, they go to the temple. I don't know if they go to the temple on Sunday, but there's, there's a particular day they go to the temple. And then, you know, in the, in the, in the Mongol tradition, so they, they, they do prayers, offerings, and then they go back. And then there's a whole community in, in where Rinpoche was, in New Jersey. New Jersey is in, um, what's that state? Uh? Uh, New York State? New Jersey? No, New Jersey is uh, near New York. I've been there once, but not really familiar. But the thing is, um, it was very suburban. And there's a, a pocket of a Mongol community there, perhaps until today, Kalmyk Mongol. All right, so that is Rimichi's background in a sense that um, what's interesting is that he was raised as an ordinary child. No exposure whatsoever, as in like, you know, like in a monastery where you are basically surrounded by Buddhism. He was just a normal American kid, child, you know, living in America, going to school, you know, most of his uh, our schoolmates were Americans, so that that's the kind of environment he was, and yet still, Rumichi felt himself different, and the little exposure he had to Buddhism, like going to the temple, on short visits and all that, he was totally amazed. It just immediately, it opens up his seats. Okay, we need to talk a little bit about what, what I'm talking about, seeds, okay? I'm not talking of the one you, you know, you throw in the garden and then it sprout plants, okay? Seeds here are referring to imprints. Okay, when you study karma in the Lam Rim, you understand what I mean. Every action that you do will fruition in a few things. It will fruition as a ripen effect. It will... In, fruition as an environmental effect it will, in, it will fruition in a few things one of them is imprints okay so this is what i'm talking about so when when the when your karma has fruition that means you're you've taken rebirth in a in a particular rebirth like as a human being in a particular country in a particular family and then what happens is as you grow up you have a particular interest in certain things all right. Some of the things that you have an interest is not environmental. It is actually your imprints. Okay, it's it's just a little exposure. It will just trigger it off, especially if, if imprints are very very strong. For example, like Rinpoche. Hence, that's makes that's why our imprints compared to Rinpoche is a whole lot of difference, because Rinpoche is very strong. Ours is quite weak. We meet Buddhism only much later. When we're young, when we see the Buddha, we lie, we fold our hands, and that's it. Okay, we we you know we get a good feeling, and that's it. So for Rinpoche, it, it's it's open into a lifelong journey. See the difference, all right? It's very different because um, so a person can, with a lot of imprints, if you do a lot of dharma, you can plant a lot of imprints in your mind. So when there's a lot of imprints in your mind, when the moment you take rebirth and you are reborn, the imprints can fruition much faster and quicker so you practice much earlier. You don't have to practice when you are 40, 50, 30 years old, you know, if you're lucky, 20. So that's the extent of our, our imprints. So if we plant a lot of imprints, meaning we do a lot of Dharma work, sincere Dharma work, um, sincere practice, offerings, 
sincere. It doesn't have to be a lot, but it's sincerity. Okay, we'll plant tremendous imprints in our mind stream. So when we have a lot of, the, of it in our mind stream, then in our next life, we can potentially meet the Dharma earlier than, you know, than normal, than, than usual. Uh, you know, most of us, is we meet the Dharma only like... A, a lot of us meet the Dharma much earlier, I'm sure. Sometimes we meet the Dharma, but nothing happens because the conditions are not right, because our imprints are not that strong. These conditions are not right because our imprints are not that strong. All right? Or some of us meet the Dharma for a short period, we are interested, and then after that, we get distracted. Perhaps work... Perhaps our, uh, uh, what do you call this? Commitment, you know, you have, to, you have to do certain things, family commitment, relationship commitment, whatever commitment, distractions. Then you, forgot, you forget Dharma is put. Then when we get older, then we realize, oh, Dharma is actually very important. Then we start going to it. Then we are really quite, sorry, I mean, a little older lah. All right, so imprints are very important. It, it's how much dharma we do in this life, how much imprints we put in our in our mind stream. So if we want to be a Rinpoche, we can. We don't need to be someone recognizes us to be a Rinpoche. We just have to do a lot of dharma sincerely. So when we do a lot of dharma sincerely, we plant a lot of imprints in our mind. So in the next life, there's high chance we'll be a Rinpoche without the name. <laughs> All right. So for Rinpoche, it's very, very obvious that Rinpoche's imprint is extremely strong because the circumstances of, his, of him fruitioning, is, it, it, it took very little for, for Rinpoche's imprint to open. You see, when it opens, what happens is you, you want to do Dharma. And Rinpoche barely understands much things when his young age, he already wants to do Dharma. He's very interested. He wants to learn about the Buddhas he see in the temple. Um, I've been, I visited the temple, uh, Rashi Jampiling and uh, Tashi Lumpo in uh, New Jersey. It's very, very beautiful inside because there's a lot of tankas. And um, you get a feeling of, a very sacred feeling like, when you go in. And it's fascinating if you like tankas. If, you don't, if you're not interested, it was just, oh, it looks nice. You know, it's, it's, it's like a museum. So it depends on your imprints. It depends on interests. All right. So for Rinpoche's, it opened, it, it was triggered very, very young. One of a sign of a high incarnation. Not just that he was interested to learn about these Buddhas and all that. Even on his own, whenever he could. Later when he started, he was, uh, when he started reading, he started looking for books on Dharma. And that's when he's studying, self-study. He, he read voraciously as much as he could. And then he learned all the, the little mantras, Om Mani Padme Hum, he would recite on his own. All right? So for us, someone has to tell you, oh, do your sadhana, recite your, recite Mixima, do Guru Yoga. Then only we do. And then we do also, we do the bare minimum. Rinpoche is reciting thousands at a, when he was very young. Because you see why it's important when we start young, we have the energy. Because when we older, we... <laughs> When we get older, we have no much energy, and then you want to do retreats. Oh, I'm very tired, lah. You know, after doing work, housework, everything, then you sit down to do your sana, you're so tired already. A lot of us are thinking like that. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> so anyway, for Rimaji, he started off very, very young. For from a from a child, from a kid, you know, he was reciting thousands of Omani Padme Hong, Om Arabaza Nadis, um, a few Buddha mantras that Rimaji recited is Omani Padme Hong. Rimiji mentioned Omar Abazanadi and Teldon. He had a special interest in the protectress, protectress Teldon Lamo. Okay, she's uh, an emanation of Saraswati. She's very ferocious and protective. It's, she's also the protectress of the Dalai Lama himself. All right. So the early, early, that, that a period of time, Rimiji was doing as much, learning as much as he can. And he was already getting premonitions. He was even playing, role-playing, you know. Um, I don't know about you, but for a lot of children who, when they were young, okay, uh, what they do is they like to have imaginary um, scenarios when they play. Some of us, we play Barbie dolls for girls, some boys. You know, they have tea party and all that. Some boys, they, they play their superheroes. All right, they imagine they are, you know, X-Men, Spider-Man, Batman, fly here, fly there, you know, uh, Transformers, um, whatever, lah, you know, whatever they are. So for Rinpoche, what, what did he, what, how did he play? 
when he was by himself, because when he was young, he, he was only not allowed so much to go out. Sometimes he had time to play with his friends, but when he was alone, he played being a llama. Yeah, he played as a llama. He pretended he used his blanket and wrapped himself like robes. I remember Rimichi said it. And then um, he would write, he would cut strips of paper and then he will scribble something. It doesn't mean anything. He's, he's, Rimichi, this is what Rimichi said. Lah. He will scribble things, pretending that he composed text and he will pretend to be teaching an imaginary audience on the floor. Okay, that's what Rimichi used to do. Imprints of a previous life, obviously. Where did this come from? <laughs> I'm sure none of us. I I certainly never. I don't even know what a llama is when I was a kid. All right, so I definitely not didn't have that kind of imprint either. I'm so I'm sure none of you did. But that's what Rimichi used to do. And then Rimichi would um he, you know he always had tremendous. The moment he saw the Buddhas in the temple, the moment he saw Buddhas in books, he had tremendous faith. And um, when he was very young, what he did was um, he had a lot of time, so he would draw little Buddha pictures and he gave it to friends. And then he would make little Buddha pendants out of paper. And then Rimichi said he wrapped it with saran wrap. I think it's like um, with cellophane tape or saran wrap to protect it so they can wear. And he tied a string to it like, like a pendant. Um, but of course, his American friends just laughed and said, why would I want to wear a green god? You know, meaning the green god is uh, Tara, la, the, is, is a goddess actually. So, because Rimichi, even at a young age, he believed that it's very protective. The Buddhas are very protective. The Buddhas have power. He had a very strong belief, naturally, from within. Again, another sign of Rimichi's imprints. And, um, yeah. So this, this is what Rinpoche used to do. He would give it out. And in fact, it's a, it became a lifelong um, practice. It's not something he didn't only him when he was a child. It's just that later on, Rinpoche, of course, when he grew older, he became more um, skilled and he was able to, to, to think wider and also able to do more things. He was, he, he, later on, Rinpoche discovered the Xerox machine, photocopying machine. Lah. In Malaysia, it's for, we call photostatting. Okay, we photostat. Rinpoche photostatted Buddhas in many sizes. Last time, what happened was someone kept all these things in a little suitcase in America and then it was shipped back to, it was shipped over to Rinpoche to Rinpoche here in Malaysia many many years ago and then Rinpoche would open it and with a lot of nostalgia Rinpoche used to tell us these things some of it was in this book some are not what I'm telling you all right so this is when Rinpoche was young you know as in a teenager and when he was then later when he came to Malaysia he started designing Buddha pendants because Rinpoche told us that in the Mongol tradition in the Kalmyk tradition, Kalmyk Mongol, um, they make little gold Buddha pendants, just like the Chinese, all right, and um, and give it to their loved ones to wear. So that's what Rinpoche started the tradition, and he designed a lot of beautiful pendants, and uh, it seemed some of them seem more jewel, more like jewelry than you know, like um, like something holy that you wear, because Rinpoche felt feels that. In order to encourage people to wear a Buddha pendant to bless them and bless other people who see, even if you design it with a lot of jewels, it's an offering to the Buddha. All right, so it's contemporary, it's modern, it's uh, appealing to people today rather than just one design because it doesn't appeal to everybody. So we actually want to have massive appeal to many, many people. So a lot of the pendants that we have in our outlets in Kuchara right now is is a brainchild of Rinpoche's that he started way back when he was a child you know when he was a kid so it's the the basis of this is that he believed that the buddha had the power to protect had the power to bless us a very strong belief that obviously doesn't come from this life like it comes from previous life his his faith it's natural because why would a child suddenly just have faith you know so yeah, so that that's um, the basis. Like it start off like that. All right, and um, interestingly, Rimji had a lot of distractions. Yeah, 
we are talking America here, okay? America is um, where everybody wants to go. Well, these days not really lah, of course, no Asian wants to go there now because you know lah. But um, but I mean, this is in the earlier days, like in the nineties, eighties. Everybody wanted to go America because it's like the American dream. It's the U.S. dollar. It's uh, Hollywood. It's uh, the you know American lifestyle where everything is comfortable, American convenience, um, everything is uh, convenient and good. And so what happens is uh, Rimji came from that background. You see, Rimji came from where everything was nice, and he forgo all that to go to India to become a monk. So it's it shows. A few things. It shows, of course, obviously, it shows what I said earlier. Rimaji's imprints are very strong. It shows his resolve. It, it shows his determination, which is extraordinary. Not many people have that kind of determination. There are people, I mean, besides Asian, there are Guailos who went to, to India to become a monk, but not, not many of them remain monks. You must remember that. Um, not many people who for the rest, after becoming a monk, remain a monk to they to they pass away to their the 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 death bed. All right. So the determination to uphold and practice the Dharma is extraordinary. That that this book is that's what this book is all about. I think it is to inspire us to overcome our little obstacles in practicing the Dharma. Okay, I'm giving you in the in the gist now. So there, there are, when you read it, you will see what Rinpoche went through, especially in America. Some of the things uh, Rinpoche spoke about in here, Rinpoche had never uh, related in a public teaching. You will not find it on YouTube. Okay, because uh, there are many times when Rinpoche gives teaching, he will tell his story. All right, some of them I don't want, I don't wish to say it out here. You can read it yourself if you want. Okay, I will highly recommend you do that. Um, to read the whole story, you, I, some of you, are, some of us are not really like a reading person. So what we can do is we can read it like a sadhana. You know, you every day you read a, two pages, three pages, so it doesn't become overwhelming. It becomes a sadhana. You know, that's why I, I encourage people to do like, for example, the Lamrim, which is five hundred pages. <laughs> So what, what they can do is read a few pages a day. So it doesn't seem like you're reading a lot. And at the same time, when you read, it, if you don't focus, then of course, it's just a, a blessing. La. If you focus, then you learn something. Okay, for Rinpoche, you don't have to worry about focus because once you start reading, it's, it's very, very um, um, gripping. Uh, I don't know what you call it, a page turner. So you, when I read it, some parts, I just want to continue, 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 continue. Some parts, I'm sorry, some parts was very emotional for me because um, cause I know Rimichi personally. You know, so it was difficult to read in a sense that after a while I had to put it down because it was, you know, <laughs> it was emotional. Okay, I see some one or two comments here. Okay, Feng Hui. In, re in retrospect, it was perfect. His mother departed his, part, his path for a while during youth. He was able to spend more time becoming Americanized before getting into monastic life, which later proved to be invaluable, especially in his proliferation of the Dharma and Dodishukdan in modern and English-speaking societies. Yes, uh, this is exactly what Rinpoche also feels and thinks later on. And... Um, with it's with this because what happens is a lot of um, a lot of the lamas the traditional lamas are usually when they are recognized at, at a very young age they are brought to the monastery and then they are educated they have very little exposure to people outside so what happens is um, once they grow up they they reach um, maybe in the teens, late teens, early 20s, then they start to travel, start to teach a little, and then um, start to, if, they, if their previous lives had centers overseas, then they would travel to these centers to, to meet students of his, of his previous life. And what happens is sometimes they, you know, sorry, but some of, sometimes they do become uh, misled. And um, sometimes they, 
they, are, they, they get caught up with politics in the center. They are not able to handle the students of the previous life because their whole life was spent in the monastery. So this, this is why Rinpoche feels that uh, he does want to receive education in his future life, um, both secular and religious, outside of the monastery, perhaps in, the in, in Kachara. All right, so it's important la, to have exposure either way. Anyway, for a Lama, once they recognize and they have students, they definitely have to meet a lot of people and definitely there'll be a lot of exposure. Either way, they will still find their way. And because that's not to say that people, uh, Lamas who have received a traditional education uh, are not able to handle students, that's not to say that either. All right, so, but... If they are exposed, it's easier to learn and faster and quicker. All right, because education is only uh, formal education is only part of your life experience, and experience, isn't it? Okay. Anyway, what was I? Okay, I was talking about uh, what was I talking about? <laughs> Rinpoche met his teachers from a very young age in the uh, in the center of his um, of New Jersey. Ken's, uh, what is his name already? Uh? Um, New Jersey. Yeah, what's Losang Tachin? Ken's Ken's Losang Tachin. Ah, oh my gosh, my memory. Ken's Losang Tachin. He had a teacher there in New Jersey. Then later, because of the situation in his household, uh, became unbearable. His parents was totally against him practicing the Dharma and was creating a lot of uh, problems with him, for him, of abuse, which Rinpoche was uh, barely able to tolerate, able to maintain at the time. Then later on, it was, they, they, were, they were not, especially his mother, was not happy with um, of Rinpoche going to the temple, of going for teachings. So he's, she, he, she was spreading rumors and all that. His foster mother like we're talking about. And then so what happened was um, he eventually came to a decision where he had to leave home. So he traveled to... Um, he, he, there were four attempts. On the final attempt, he managed to arrive at Los Angeles. America is like that. Okay, this is America. This is east, this is west. New Jersey is on this side. Los Angeles is all the way on this side. Okay, across America, you know, he traveled. He hitchhiked across America to decide to Los Angeles. Actually, his original goal was going all the way to Hawaii. But it didn't, it didn't happen. Marcus Fu. I never met Rinpoche, but undoubtedly after watching YouTube videos on Rinpoche and, and on his life, undoubtedly he changed my life. Never has a Buddhist master done that before. Hope his swift re unmistaken reincarnation will return as soon as possible. Thank you very much. That's very nice. It probably is because of um, Rinpoche's teachings and um, how it affects. I noticed one thing about Rinpoche. I mean, I can share some of the things Rinpoche talks about, but I cannot change your life. <laughs> but Rinpoche has a, this ability to do that for people. And Rinpoche has spoken about it before. And he said that everybody can have that effect. It doesn't have to be a Rinpoche. Anybody who talks the Dharma, who practice as much as he can, the Dharma, you cannot be someone who teach, express the Dharma, and behind you don't really practice. Okay, you have to practice as to the best of your ability. Of course, we are not, we are not, we don't at, the, at this point we cannot practice like renunciation, emptiness, the higher teachings at the moment. But what happened? Whatever we know, we practice. It's not something we we shouldn't, pra you know, we shouldn't share Dharma with people uh, on the basis that oh, you know, it's some it's knowledge. It's this is like this, you know. But we ourselves don't practice it. So if if you practice what you share. Rinpoche said, your dharma will become moist. This is what Rinpoche said, that uh, he was quoting his guru, Song Rinpoche. Actually, I'll talk a little bit about Song Rinpoche after this. Um, Song Rinpoche told Sam Rinpoche, 
this. If your practice of the Dharma, if you practice the Dharma, okay, and you share the Dharma, your Dharma teachings will have power to affect change in people. All right. So you don't have to be a Rinpoche, you don't have to be a pastor, you can be you and share the Dharma. Because let's put it this way, la. if you're able, if you learn a little bit from Rinpoche's teachings and you're able to share whatever you've learned and it has affected you and you practice it, you can, you can have that effect on people as well. Okay, you can. Although I said I cannot, but I mean, this is what Rinpoche said. La. Let's follow what Rinpoche says. Okay, you can have that effect, especially if you practice the Dharma. If you have the, that faith and confidence, all right. So it's important to understand this fact because um, then our our sharing the Dharma will have effect and power. And when he has power, you you will bring a confidence in your practice that you have never known, a happiness that you a satisfaction a satisfaction in knowing that you're able to help people with the dharma and in buddhism that's the highest form of giving you can give money you can give gifts you can give food you can protect people you can give the gift of protection like you share things to help people with life skills and advice and all that but a higher even a higher one than that all right the highest in buddhism is the gift of Dharma. So if you're able to share Dharma, that is the most powerful way to give, to practice generosity, giving. All right? Andri Nugroho Sihananto. What an exotic name. I just watched Rinpoche videos since February 2021. And honestly, he's explained Dharma clearly than more than any master that I've ever met before. Thank you very much. Yeah, because Rinpoche's background in a sense that I think Rinpoche has a way of relating to people, uh, to modern individual, and as, also because Rinpoche comes from, um, was raised in America. So he, he understands people today very, very well. So when he teaches, it's very, very clear. It is tailored for a modern practitioner. All right. Nice Indonesia. I hope you are. You guys are well here. There. Sorry. Spencer Surya O'Boyle. Rinpoche La was really great. He gave his entire life strictly for liberation of others. I will be forever grateful for his teachings and forever grateful to the Kacharians and the pastors for maintaining his YouTube channel. Very nice. Yes. It's also very nice to keep revisiting the teachings from time to time because um, Rinpoche's teaching has this actually Dharma in general has this effect when you keep when you keep over time revisit the teachings from time to time especially Rinpoche's because you will have a different perspective you will get something different each time all right you will get something different each time and sometimes you'll never know an answer is in the teachings you heard before but it was meant for later so um, yeah, it's very, very powerful. And it is um, a legacy of Rinpoche's, okay? Thank you very much for the feedback. I really, really appreciate it. And um, yeah, let me see anything I missed. So Rinpoche's, oh yeah, I wanted to speak about Rinpoche's teachers, all right? Um, I spoke about Kenso Losan Tachin in New Jersey. Then he went to, he traveled, he hitchhiked from one side of America to the other, to, to um, Los Angeles. And there he, you know, Los Angeles, okay? Los Angeles is um, Hollywood, okay? Um, everybody go there to, to, to go onto Hollywood Boulevard to see the stars, you know, to um, to shop, to enjoy life, to go clubbing. Um, Rinpoche, when he went there, I mean, he did all that. He, but more importantly, he went in search of a center, of a lama. Not initially a lama, but a center to continue on his practice. And um, and then when he finally found his way to a center. Um, 
Dupton Darjeeling TDL, uh, St. Andrew's Place. I remember the first center, lah, he moved, lah, of course, eventually. And um, the Lama there was Geshe, Geshe Trum Gyaltsen. He's not a high Lama in a sense of a Rinpoche, but he's high, he's very attained and um, a great uh, meditational master and a great scholar. Okay, Geshe is um, a, a, a Lama who has received an education, a, a, a monk who has received an education, ordinary monk, not a Rinpoche. Yeah? Okay, let me explain a few differentiations, the few terms first. Lama, Rinpoche, Guru, Toku. Rinpoche literally means precious one. It's like a title. It's like a um, it's it's a title. It's a um, that's given to, usually when upon recon, recognition of a reincarnated lama, a teacher. Okay, let's not talk, bring the lama in first. A teacher who is reincarnated and is recognized officially by the monastery, then that uh, will be known as a rinpoche. A rinpoche so and so. Like for example, Chen Rinpoche, okay. That's Rinpoche, a title given, all right. Lama, Lama has many meanings, by the way, as in many words lie in Tibet. Tibet. <laughs> but Lama, Lama can be used for a Buddha like Lama Tsongkhapa, Lama Manjushri, Lama Dodi Shukden. So Lama actually is a term, a contraction of Lama Mepa which means one without fault. So, but this term is used for mainly for a teacher, a guru, or a Buddha. Okay, so this too. And then some of you may think, oh, what about some people who, you know, in Nepal, they, they call themselves Lama, like, uh, you know, Monlam Lama, this, you know, it becomes a name. So that's different. That's Let's not bring that in because some of it is also a name, but in this case, traditionally is used to refer to a teacher, all right, a teacher or a Buddha. Okay, so we remember Jay? Lama, Lama is teacher, Lama and then Guru. Okay, Lama is Tibetan, Rinpoche is Tibetan, the word I'm talking about, Tibetan, Tibetan, Guru, Guru is originally Sanskrit. Okay, we even in Malaysia, we in the in the indigenous language here, the, the Malay language, we use the word guru as well to refer to a teacher. Okay, a secular teacher. So a guru is your spiritual teacher. It can be actually any teacher, but your spiritual teacher. Specifically in Buddhism, we're referring to a spiritual teacher, all right? So um that's why guru and lama can be used interchangeably and can be confusing if you are if you didn't realize, they're actually the same thing. And by the way, Lama, I, I need to point out one more thing, especially for the Chinese speakers, all right? For the Chinese speakers, Lama does not mean monk originally, but the Chinese refer to a monk as Lama. I understand it's a language thing, um, but in Tibetan, they do not do that. They do not refer to monks as Lama. Okay, Lama specifically is your teacher. Okay, your your spiritual teacher, your yeah, and that's guru, that's lama, and then um, what's the last one ah? Uh, uh, tuku, tuku, tuku is referring to reincarnated teachers, um, yeah, reincarnated teachers, specifically as a collective term. Actually, Tuku itself, the term is referring to an emanation body of a Buddha. Okay, it's a technical term in the scriptures. All right, so it refers to emanation because many of the reincarnated teachers are emanations of bodhisattvas. All right, so so uh, that term became used to refer collectively to refer to reincarnated teachers, but it's not a term that is used like a title. So the title is usually a Rinpoche. So, tuku is uh, this is a collective uh, generic term. Um, you can refer to tem tuku, and you can refer to to tem rinpoche. So there is in the past rinpoche had uh, a lot of 
issues about explaining to Malaysians about the difference between Rinpoche and Tuku. So he realized, just put it all together. So he used to refer to himself as Tem Tuku Rinpoche. So in Tibetan, that is uh, redundant. Okay, Rinpoche and Tuku is redundant. You can read Tem Rinpoche or Tem Tuku. All right, so it's redundant. Hence, um, just so that Malaysians would understand actually it's the same thing. Okay, but by tradition, in in because this is a Tibetan terminology, it's Tibetan culture, lah. So you either tem to go or tem rinpoche. So after so after when the organization became more established, then rinpoche uh, began to revert back to more just tem rinpoche. All right. Okay, I got a few comments here. From Mr. Lum, Rinpoche's videos are very inspiring. Of my favorite is Wheel of Sharp Weapons. Every time I watch it, different meanings arise and I realize different aspects on karma. May his eminence return soon. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah, we, the Wheel of Sharp Weapons is a very, very old teaching that uh, rose in Indonesia, Sumatra, uh, by the, the teacher by the name of Dhammarakshita. I think the Tibetans refer to him as Sir Lingpa, if I'm not mistaken. And um, he, he's the teacher of Atisha, the Indian teacher who brought, who revitalized teachings and who started the Lamrim tradition in Tibet. All right. So he brought this set of teachings called the Wheel of Sharp Weapons and it was recorded down in verse form. And uh, it speaks on karma and it speaks on um, the self-cherishing mind, the self-grasping mind. All right, so he put it in verse form explaining from a karmic point of view, every possible permutation of whatever that can happen to you from, you know, droughts and uh, theft uh, to friends deserting you, enemies getting you to disease, what is the karmic uh, result? What is the karmic, uh, the origin, the cause of it, the karmic cause and what to do about it? So. It's very, very powerful teaching. It is a meditational tool to train the mind. Okay? So, yeah. So, that's why the teaching is very powerful in a sense because it, it gives you an overall picture of how things happen to us for a particular reason and uh, all arising from this selfish mind. Actually, all karmas come from that, arises from that. All right? That's very interesting. Feng Hui says, um, I also stumbled upon his videos just maybe a couple of months ago. Oh yeah, I came across a video where he said Tibetans sometimes offer beer to Pelton Hamo. Could you expound more on that, Pastor, about liquor offerings? <clears throat> okay, that's kind of like out of topic. But anyway, just to very, very quick, it's called Golden Drink or Sirkim. Sirkim is a particular offering to a Dharma protector. In the past, uh, it can be... It, it, Originally, it was golden referring to tea because tea was precious. You know, tea came from China and it was expensive. It was a precious beverage and it was offered to the Dharma protector in times of need in, in order to create circumstances for help or assistance uh, or to overcome a particular problem. All right. So um, that, those are the times. It's not just Belden Lamo. It's also any Dharma protector. Okay, it's, it's become a kind of a fixed tradition for, for in, in, in propitiating a Dharma protector, you offer Sukkim. So it can be tea, it can be alcohol. In the past, in alcohol, but because in the Buddhist center, that is not very appropriate to offer alcohol. So we just refer to, prefer to offer tea. All right. But the, the meaning of it is for quick assistance. All right. And then um, Joy says, thank you for your sharing on our Guru PDL. May Rinpoche's life continue to inspire and bless many beings now and in the future. Yeah, very nice. Okay, so where was I? Oh, yeah, Rinpoche's teachers. Rinpoche has a very interesting um, devotion to his teachers in a sense that um, 
he never he had many many teachers from from uh, Kensal Lawson Tachin, then we have Gesi Jum Gelson, then we have Song Rebuche, and then when he went to the monastery, he had um Kensal Jampa Yeshi, Lati Rimuchi, and a whole host of many teachers, including Gang Chen Rimuchi and so forth. Alright. So you see, he wasn't looking for um, teachers. He had one teacher, he was happy. And it's just that at the time it was necessary because he had to move. So when he traveled from um, from New Jersey to Los Angeles, he wasn't being he wasn't able to be near his teacher. So he actually called back his teacher, Kensu Lawson Tachin, to ask permission to take on Geshe Jerome Gelson. Okay, this is in accordance to fifty verses of Guru Devotion. He respected his teacher that much to ask for permission. These days we don't. We just go from one teacher to another teacher to another teacher and then whatever strikes our fancy and whatever initiation they give, whatever name they have, wow, you know, they are em His Eminence, His Holiness, Sri Sri Sri, whatever. Sorry. <laughs> you know, when we see a Guru's teacher, a teacher, a Rinpoche from Tibet, uh, the hat, you know, an official picture, portrait of the teacher, the hand, we're so, wow, I want to receive teachings, we're, we're inspired. Then we forget our teachers, our previous teacher that we took refuge with, who we were close with, or who is not around anymore. So Rinpoche had a very different devotion to his teacher. For example, his devotion to Song Rinpoche. Song Rinpoche was what is known as his Rinpoche's root guru. A root guru, or Cao Yi, Lama, I'm sorry, this is Tibetan, I can't pronounce Tibetan very well, but literally, Cao Lama means root guru, okay, your main guru, the guru who changed your life, your, des your, your practice, all right? So for me, obviously, it's Sam Rinpoche, and uh, for you, maybe, or someone else, doesn't matter. So what happens is uh, Rinpoche had an unusual devotion to Song Rinpoche. Why I say unusual is because Song Rinpoche was only with Rinpoche for six months. Six months. But it changed Rinpoche's life forever. All right. Six months was spent. Rinpoche received all many, many, many lineages, including Dodi Shukden. And you know, lah, with, with Dodi Shukden, there were, it came with a whole host of issues later on. And uh, along with it, a promise to be a monk. Okay, because he Tem Rinpoche asked Song Rinpoche um, whether he should be a monk, which was one of his uh, dreams, or he should be an actor, which also is a passion of his, uh, because he thought that he, by becoming an actor, he could raise funds. He, I mean, he could earn a lot and, and, and help support his Geshe Turum uh He was struggling. His teacher was struggling to survive. You know, so that's what he thought. Then Song Rinpoche just told him. It wasn't an instruction from Song Rinpoche even. You know, you don't. He didn't say you become a monk. He didn't say that. He said, if you become a monk, you'll be very beneficial. If you become an actor, you have karma for it. You'll be successful. You choose. So immediately, Rinpoche folded his hands. He said, I will be a monk, and he kept his promise. So that is something to inspire us. That's not something to just, wow, nice story, you know. It's something to inspire us in the sense that, well, how does it inspire us? Are we going to be monks and nuns? Not necessary. If you're going to be fantastic, if you promise your teacher, fulfill your promise. Do not forget your promises you've made to your teacher. Whether it's a promise that is you yourself promised to your teacher verbally in writing, or you wish to do, um, or it was Rinpoche telling you it would be good to do this. Sometimes we get little messages from Rinpoche. I mean, I'm talking of not, not imagination, you know, in your dream. I mean, like a note from Rinpoche when Rinpoche was alive or whatever, who told you what to do in, in your spiritual practice, especially in your spiritual practice. Like, for example, what practices you should do. For example, Rinpoche said, let's say he gave you uh, uh, an instruction that take Manjushri as you eat them. Learn man about, all about Manjushri. Be a master of Manjushri's practice. Let's say. Then we should go all about and do it all the way. As much as we can. There can only be benefit if you do. Alright? 
So that is so when you read Rinpoche's story, that is how you inspire yourself to practice. All right, it, it, it doesn't have to be oh you have to be a monk and all that. No, no, it is whatever whatever that was you have promised, whatever instructions you have received is to carry it all the way as much as you can. Yes, there are some instructions that can change over time that are more time sensitive. For yeah, there there is many variations of things. But we're talking of spiritual instructions now, more so uh, in terms of spiritual instructions. So for some of us, Rinpoche had told us to practice the da- sorry, to do Dharma work, to do voluntary work, to help someone, to be close to your family. You know, these are the things I, I mean, I'm thinking from memory. Uh, this is what Rinpoche would usually tell people, okay, to give instructions to people to... Every time when Rinpoche tells people to do things, it is to benefit the person and it's to long-term. It's for long-term, all right? Uh, I'm thirsty. Okay. Um, I don't think I have time to read or I didn't go through much of Rinpoche's life. <laughs> So it's it's a bit difficult to go through everything because it's something you need to read. And even when you read, just to be honest, even when you read this entire book, you barely scratch the surface of Rinpoche's life or what he has accomplished, what he has done for this. But at least you understand the the over, overview of what Rinpoche has accomplished. Like when he was young, the teachers he devoted himself to um, I mentioned about Song Rinpoche, how Song Rinpoche had the few instructions, the few teachings changed Rinpoche's life, like, you know, like to be a monk, to practice Doti Shukden, and his, and his uh, many of his core uh, practices, meditational practices, from, for example, Heruka, uh, Chittamani Tara, and so forth, all came from Song Rinpoche. That's a very interesting question. Okay, Feng Hui asks, did Rinpoche have a girlfriend? I'm sure I saw an early picture of him together with his guru, which was taken in the US. And he had, he had this American girl by his side. I'm sure it's in the auto bio. I know who you're talking about. Uh, I don't recall her name, but that's not Rinpoche's girlfriend. Rinpoche never had a girlfriend, nor a boyfriend. Rinpoche is, wanted to be a monk all along. And so Rinpoche didn't want to dally in relationships. And uh, Rinpoche feels that relationships for, for himself, he doesn't say, oh, you have to think like that. For Rinpoche, for Rinpoche, relationships is a bit of a distraction. This is how Rinpoche view it. It's a distraction. And because you have to focus all your attention on one person, and um, versus if you are not in a relationship, you can focus on many more people. That's how Rinpoche views it. So um, Rinpoche all along have um, close friends, both girls, boys. And um, so Rinpoche never, was never into a relationship. There wasn't a priority. Okay, that was not Rinpoche's girlfriend. I mean, to cut the long story short, that was not Rinpoche's girlfriend. All right. So for people, um, for students, um, Rinpoche encourage people to be close to their spouse, encourage people to be close to their partners, to practice the Dharma together. Since you already have, because some of us, um, I think most of us, lah, if you want to be totally celibate and become a monk, maybe not for us. It's not for everyone to be a monk. But if you're going to, if you made a promise, you made a determination. Go all the way. All right, go all the way. So that's how um, I hope that helps you with your whether that's Rinpoche's girlfriend. <laughs> that's a very interesting question. All right, uh, I think I need to come to a conclusion now. Uh, okay, there was uh, from Los Angeles to. Rinpoche became a monk, went to India, from India, how Rinpoche came to Malaysia, just in a very quick nutshell. Rinpoche came to in Malaysia not because he wanted to teach raise funds from inside, but because the monastery needed funds, needed someone to go and teach, 
and reach out, outreach. Rinpoche was young at that time. Rinpoche was um, obviously he's uh, he's American. He's able to speak English. He's able to converse with foreigners. Most of the the monks in the monastery could not. They were only speaking strictly in Tibetan, and uh, very few monks were able to converse with um, to speak to give teachings in in languages other than Tibetan. So what happened was uh, Rinpoche was given the sacred duty to raise funds to teach and uh, Rinpoche was reluctant. Uh, many other monks, young monks, ordinary monks, given the opportunity would have ran and you know did their best to you know to do to go overseas to raise funds you know but Rinpoche did not. Rinpoche had a different plan in mind he wanted to be a meditator. That was his real intention real reason because he wanted to serve his teacher, become a monk, serve his teacher, and then when, when he get older, he wanted to retreat into the mountains, into the wilderness, and um, to do his practice. He wanted, he wanted so much to be a meditator, a yogi, to meditate and achieve high levels of uh, attainments. All right? Okay. Um... Someone asked here, Yvonne, you asked about Rinpoche's mother. I, I think you assume, you are, I assume you're referring to his real mother. Rinpoche's real mother is still alive as far as we know, but she does not want to have any contact with Rinpoche for reasons of her own. She has still, basically the conclusion about why she doesn't want to have contact is because she couldn't come to terms with what she experienced when she had Rinpoche. The relationship that bore Rinpoche, that, that resulted in Rinpoche was uh, out of wedlock. Okay, the, the father, the Tibetan, was already married at that time. So it was kind of a big scandal for her and she couldn't handle it. At that time, she was a young girl and there was a lot of rumors circulating in her community and she is a princess. She is a um, of royal blood and so it was a big shame for her that it scarred her for life. So what happened was uh, she never had wanted to have contact nor any relations, any contact, any remembrance of that relationship and unfortunately it included Rinpoche along with it. So she had contact with Rinpoche until Rinpoche later on in his life where he Rinpoche found, discovered his father and um, when the mother found out, she, she totally withdrew. She didn't want any contact at all until now. Alright, so in a nutshell, that's what happened. She's aware that Rinpoche had entered into Parinirvana. I mean, we sent... Um, um, some of one of our students sent info. Uh, it, she's informed la. Whether she she actually received it, we don't fully know, but definitely she's informed. All right. Unfortunately, it has come to that la. Rimche's foster mother had passed away many years ago. All right. Okay. Yeah. Where was I? So yeah. I think uh, to come to a conclusion, Rinpoche, yeah, so where was I? Rinpoche was uh, in the monastery, so he, 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 he found his way, he got a sponsor to, um, for his um, debts because he had a bit of a credit card debts. Living in Los Angeles, the, the cost of living is very high, so he had a lot of debts, so it was uh, cleared, and then he got a one-way ticket to India. He was ordained. He entered into a Ganden, into the house of Song Rimichi, Song Ladrang. And um, then later on, he was recognized as a reincarnation. He, and along the way, he served his teacher, Kenso Jampa Yeshi Rimichi, which was uh, an ex abbot of the monastery, and uh, who also enthroned Rimichi as. Um, Sam Rinpoche. All right, so he was requested to come to Malaysia to teach. He came to Malaysia. He was reluctant because he wanted. Uh, oh yeah, uh, uh, um, he wanted to be a meditator. So that I wanted to end at that point because throughout my time with Rinpoche, there's one of the things that Rinpoche repeated the most 
was his longing to go into retreat. And um, I guess part of it was, um, there's a few reasons why Ramesh keep reminding <laughs> telling us that. One of them was, was that he does really want to. One other one is to, to explain to, to us how he feels because we, for us, we can, you know, uh, for us and for Rinpoche is very different. For us, if we want to not practice the Dharma, we want to go back into secular life, we want to go back into our attachments, uh, making money, our family, our relationships, um, non-Dharma things, and pursuits, enjoyment, fun. For Rinpoche, he, he, that's not of his interests. His interest is in Dharma, his interest is in attainments. And um, so that's why he, it's a very stark difference between Rinpoche and us in that sense. Because for him, that's freedom. For us, whatever we want to escape Dharma from, for some of us, we are, when we, when, you know, when we have our moods at time, <laughs> all of us, me, you, you know, when we want, we always think of Dharma as something that, oh, you know, we have to do, we're forced to do, we want to do. Sometimes we have good mood, then, oh, it's nice. Sometimes we don't have good mood, then it's not nice. And then we wish we do, we we're doing something else instead. So for Rinpoche, it's not like that at all. It's not like that at all. For Rinpoche, it's, it, Dharma is a joy. Sometimes it's difficult because of people, but it's a joy because it brings, it leads to freedom. That's how Rinpoche sees it. It leads to freedom. Attainments is freedom. Okay, anything else leads to attachment, leads to suffering, more problems. And um, some of us realize it, some, we know it intellectually, but we don't fully grasp it. We don't fully embrace it. So that's why um, for us, Rinpoche always tells us to always remember why you enter into the Dharma, why you came to Dharma, what, what's, what was the feeling, initial feeling, when you do not forget that. He always reminds us to remember that feeling, to remember the reason we came into the Dharma in the first place, whether it's a teaching, whether whatever teaching, whatever feeling that we received from a teaching or whatever, a gift from someone, uh, a, a friend who brought us to the Dharma, whatever it is, do not forget that because we need it when, when times are, because this is life, this is samsara. We always go through difficult times. So likewise for Rinpoche, when during difficult times, he always think of him, himself in the, in the mountains, meditating, doing retreats and at peace. So eventually Rinpoche did achieve peace, but that's, you know, at, um, at his uh, his passing. So in his passing, Rinpoche, uh, in a nutshell, in a very quick, <laughs> quick, quick summary, he, he died in meditation. It's called Tuktam, clear light meditation. All right. And then when, he, during that time, he is already clinically dead, meaning he's not breathing. There's no heartbeat, but his chest is warm. Okay, he's, that, that, that's the time when high lamas are in meditation. So that's, uh, that's called Tuktam or clear light. All right. So what happens is um, when, he, when he finally leaves his meditation to enter perhaps in the pure land, what happens is um, there'll be a drop of blood that will emerge. All right. So during that time, I remember in the hospital, we were, the, the high lamas told us, prepare, make sure you put something white here because it's usually very small. If you can't see it, you might miss it. So what happens if we had to look, scramble off. In the end, we couldn't find anything. We found a big pillowcase, white color put here. Because Rinpoche, that time he passed away already, he was dressed in his robes. His maroon robes, okay, it's maroon. So if there's a drop of blood, you can't see. <laughs> so there was a white um, pillowcase placed here, and we saw that. that. So Rinpoche left only two days. After two days, luckily, because we are in a hospital, okay, Rinpoche is clinically dead already. Okay, no heartbeat, no breathing. So that is, is um, there's a law, you know, you can't stay in a, I don't know, it's all right to say it now, but anyway. Um, yeah, so you can't leave in the hospital. So because of, luckily, because of special arrangements are being made. All right, so what happens was, uh, Ruchi left to come in two days. That's one of the signs of a high lama. 
a person who passed away in uh, con full control. Okay, last question, since you have a question. By Feng Hui again. Last question, why did Rinpoche go back to the US in the early 2010s? I saw a video where Kachara team helped him find a place in LA or something. Did he con contemplate of relocating to the US again? Very, very good question. Um, I was... Me and Pastor Neral halfway went to uh, assist Rimichi in, in the US. Rimichi did go back. At that time, Rimichi was in the process of weaning Kachara off his, um, his direction. Weaning means what? Some of you may not fully understand the word. Weaning means, weaning off means because we depend on Rimichi for his direction for a very long, long time. There are many, many re reasons why Rinpoche does certain things, but this is one of the reasons, okay? I, can, I cannot tell every single reason Rinpoche had because Rinpoche does many actions, he does that's major like that for many, many reasons, all right? One of them is that, all right? Another thing is disappointed with some students, of course, some issues, some problems, and then, um, yeah, and also, perhaps it's his last visit to... Sometimes, haven't you, you know, when many people are going to pass away, they want to go back and see their hometown, something like that. That's probably a third reason, I think. Because in hindsight, when you look back, it's not very long before Rinpoche. It's in 2015, 2015, I think, 2015, 2016. Not, not early 2010s, 2015, 2016, I think. All right, so that was that period of time, and um, yeah. So Rinpoche did did consider relocating to um, yes, what you said is true. Rinpoche did consider, but um, Rinpoche came back in the end. All right, he came back to Malaysia, and he uh, continued to do certain works uh, in Malaysia until his passing. Uh, for the organization and for the, the lineage as a whole. And also, of course, Rinpoche worked very, very hard on the blog on talking about Doji Shukden as well during that period, after, you know, after that period, actually. All right, so um, it's, come a, it's kind of a bit of a rush, but never mind. Um, I hoped I give you some feeling about this book, about Rinpoche's uh, journey in his in this life, and Rinpoche did a lot for a person to accomplish this much is incredible. Um, it's only a it's all, it's a sign of a, a highly attained meditational master. Highly attained because sometimes attainments are not expressed by oh you know creating a miracle or having a vision of a Buddha or having a vision of the future doesn't actually mean that. A, me a sign of a meditation master is able to accomplish tremendous benefit for many, many beings. Many, many beings. Okay, that's a sign of a, a highly attained meditation master, especially of the Mahayana tradition, of uh, the tradition of Bodhisattvas in benefiting others. All right. So I hope I give you a feeling of this book, of who Rinpoche is, and hope I hope I inspire you guys to read more. I'm not able to express much. I'm not even able to read because I don't think it's kind of I'm way past my time. And um, I need to do dedication now. And uh, we'll be celebrating Rinpoche's Pari Nirvana on the 4th of September, which is Saturday. Not tomorrow, the next week. All right, this is the second year of Rinpoche's uh, Pari Nirvana, the second year after his Pari Nirvana, his passing. All right, we hope to look for Rinpoche's incarnation by establishing the incarnation chapel, the relic temple, and Rinpoche's stupa. Okay, that will bring about the causes that will enable us to search for Rinpoche's incarnation. At the moment, I'm sure some of you are asking, is there any sign yet? I don't, I'm not aware of any sign at the moment. Unfortunately, may a sign appear for us soon to find its unmistaken clear incarnation. All right.
Chanju Sancho Rinpoche, Maki Panagi Gushe, Keba Yamami Payang, Gone Gondu Pawasho, Tony Tonga Rinpoche, Maki Panagi Gushe, Keba Yamami Payang, Gone Gondu Pawasho, Dazo Chen Saba Gewadi, Tan Andrua Gunlan Kampana, Jeba Joso, Los Antrapa, Tanping Borido Sao Shesho, Kewa Kundo Yana Lamanda, Jemi Choki Pala Long Choche, Sada Lanke on Tenachoni, Doji Changi Gopang Yutosho, Gewadi Yududa, Lama Sange Jukuni, Joa Chikan Malupa, De Sala Gopasho, Chiju Dabo. Songaba, Chosona, Mapewala, Gekisha Majiwadan, Duni Malushan, Dada Shange do Sundan, Jewash Latini, Gawa Los Antrapai, Tampani Bag, Yushi, Modala Center, Nemeko and Delection, Yasan Tatu Delapel, Contraso and Jingulo, Contraso in Modroso, Contraso in Tashi Show, Jason Lama Kusa Raptanchi, Nam Kachi Nijo Gibata, Los Antami Joe in Samsungi, Drummond Sotak to Negushi, Kanri Rawi, Koa Shingam, then Penendawa Malukian Wine, Chen Raising One Thousand Gasai, Shapi City, Badu Dan Gushi, Hong Tombing Modro Malupa, Dindi Dala. So, God and Temple Lord Chanam gave us such a shuktan cell. Thank you and good night.